Greetings, friends, and welcome to another episode of The Mistake Zone, your weekly dose of our lives and the mistakes within them. My name is Jaron Wade. Joining me, as always, one of my best friends in the whole wide world, Matt Alba. Hey, Matt. Yo. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Matt, mm. it's great. We're here another week, and Matt, mm-hmm. needless to say, once again, our boy Wallet Coon, mm-hmm. not doing so great. Matt. Oh, no, Jim. Not doing so great. What happened? Because Matt, mm-hmm. yesterday near the Saturday morning arcade clubhouse, there was the CSC trade show, which is a I'm not sure if it's an annual event, but one of the bigger sort of card trade shows um, that happens within the area. And this was definitely something that my partner and I were looking forward to ever since we were made aware of it. We purchased our uh, advanced tickets Uh and we were expecting to, you know, just go in, go around the different tables, probably pick up some cards and spend, I don't know, Matt, maybe two, three hours. Uh, We ended up spending close to five hours at the event in total. Okay, Mm -hmm. And that caused us to return, you know, drive back towards the Mistake Zone HQ at a less than ideal time. Got hit with some pretty bad traffic, but Ooh, not as mm-hmm. bad as our boy Wallet Coon, Matt. <laughs> but uh-huh. uh, in terms of the trade show itself, there were uh, just so many different vendors, Matt. So many um, tables full of cards. And just to see the just the energy of everyone there really for the most part good vibes nothing really too alarming in terms of bad mojo uh bad attitude just you know people coming together matt i wore mm-hmm. my hollow live sauna hoodie uh shout out to sauna mm-hmm. and immediately when we were walking to the venue since we tried to get there before doors open someone stopped me and said hey bro Cool hoodie. Nice. And I was like, thanks, man. Nice. So, Matt, you know me. I went in with the full intention to find my fellow y Schwarz freaks and <laughs> to find some, you know, gold foil signatures. Because, Matt, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. when we've visited, you know, the low, the smaller trade shows, the collector shows with, near the Mistake Zone HQ, uh, I would hear vendors talk about how the Y Shores market, you know, pretty niche market in terms of kind of appeal and vendors. Uh, they don't really don't find a lot of vendors carrying it. And the vendors you do talk to really, for the most part, say how hard it is to move bulk cards, the freaks of the you know, <laughs> since Y Shores covers a whole bunch of different properties, collabs with a bunch of different brands, mm-hmm. uh, most of the players, if you play, you have your own decks, you have the cards you want, and everyone else just wants the signature card. So a lot of people I heard mention that, you know, this show would, or at least this area, the shows within this area would have more of a turnout. Uh, mm-hmm, just mm-hmm. because that's where the freaks are, Matt. Me included. Me included. Mm-hmm. Uh, Matt, needless to say, not that many freaks uh, of the y Squares variety here. A lot of Pokemon, mm-hmm. uh, even though this was mostly promoted as a, you know, sports collectible cards. Oh, Matt, I see. So much Pokemon. So, so much Pokemon. To the point where even walking around, Matt, it pains me to say, but you heard some people go, wow, not a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh! <laughs> vendors here either. Yeah. Um, Matt, I think in terms of Yu-Gi-Oh, I, I only saw maybe three to four different vendors that included them. Mm-hmm. And Matt, this was 50 plus vendors. So, mm. uh, and then for the Y Shores, really only three vendors and one guy was, it, it was a weird, it was a weird experience for that table, Matt, where, uh, I, so I was walking around and then I see within one of the corners, some guy, you know, with all the magic cards, with all the Yu-Gi-Oh cards. And then behind him, mm-hmm. I see him propped up binders that I see Hololive signatures and then I see Miku signatures. And I, 
you know, went up okay. and asked, hey, can I look it through those binders? And he said, oh, those binders aren't really, like, I don't have anything priced. I only really brought them because some vendors uh, asked me to bring them so they can go through. And that already, uh-huh. that that kind of put me off that, that vendor just because it's, why are you displaying them? And, but, like, you know, he was still cool. He let me browse through the different books, just seeing all the different um signatures and when he gave me the binders specifically said yeah they're all signatures i'm like yeah no duh <laughs> like mm-hmm. if you're bringing your wise Schwartz cards to this it's going to be signatures but mm-hmm. um since the nothing was priced and he already prefaced it by saying oh these are for you know vendors that asked me to bring them like i didn't want to kind of engage in that practice yeah i don't want to yeah. do the rigmarole yeah so you know put that back but luckily i found another table uh that had you know one section dedicated to watch wars cards matt and mm-hmm. i was able to pick up two uh you know gold foil signature miku cards and then one uh, Kanata card uh, vol- from Hollow Live Volume 1 English. There were some other ones as well, but I didn't want to go too deep just because those three cards uh, so far, pretty penny. Mm-hmm. Uh, pretty penny. But this brings me up to my point that I brought to you before, but I needed to reiterate it here. Matt, mm-hmm. bad at haggling. I hate yeah, haggling yeah. Mm-hmm. so much. Where after, you know me and how I get Matt, where after this exchange, I was kind of put down because I looked at the prices that were listed, calculated something in my head and it said, Hey, would you do, you know, X amount for these three cards? Mm -hmm. Uh, Which is not it's a mistake because (laughs) you should be asking what's the best you can do for me. And then you haggle from there. Uh, And after I left my ex, I thought I got a good deal, but not, Mm-hmm. I, I probably could have got a better deal if I asked, you know, if I opened with what can you do for me, where uh, that, I I'm see. not sure if you remember mm-hmm. that King of the Hill episode where Peggy is trying to buy a car and Hank's like, no, don't worry, I, I can handle this. And when he comes back, he tells Peggy, don't worry, I paid sticker price. That, <laughs> I felt like Hank Hill at that moment. So Amazing. my partner really good at haggling, but me really bad at haggling. But mm-hmm. in terms of other things that got Wallet Coon, you know, shouting out to one of the things I mentioned in last year's of the year episode, uh, Matt, we're pretty much close to our complete uh, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet 151 master set. Mm-hmm. Um I'm not one of those freaks that do the super master set of I need everything as a common plus their reverse hollow plus their hollow like variants. I think for us, it's just one of each card, whether it be a normal card, a hollow card or a reverse hollow card. And right now, all we're missing are like two of the Mew cards, which um, you are pretty available. So I think that's something we'll kind of pick up in the future. Uh, plus some other promo cards that are also pretty cheap uh, in terms of underselling. So mm-hmm. I think the only reason I want to mention that is, Matt, this is the first time I've nearly completed a card set collection. And got to admit, Matt, flipping through the binder with <laughs> an almost complete set, pretty cool. Pretty cool, Matt. Nice, uh, nice, nice, nice. What did it co- cost more than all the other art books cur- that I rotate <laughs> on our coffee table? But uh, this is going to be in the coffee table rotation. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. finally, for the CSC trade show event, one thing I have to mention, Matt, mm-hmm. a lot of little kids in general just being hustlers, oh, you know, not only do you have the vendors of, you know, the dad and the son uh, duo, but Mm -hmm. some instances where we would see kids just trying to hustle, trying to, we we saw one kid sell or trade up his, you know, this PSA 8 card for a slightly better card. And then we saw him right after walk to another vendor and try to trade up. So he was probably doing one of those trade up challenges for himself. Oh, man. Every time when we saw that one exchange go down, my partner immediately turned to me afterwards and said, that, that vendor like legit got ripped off by that kid. Where there were so there were a few instances of just us watching these, you know, they can't be older than 12 or so oh, with man. all these different card slabs and trying to make deals with different vendors, Matt. Mm-hmm. Not couldn't be me. Could, say, Jaren, couldn't be me. 
Oh, man. I'm there paying Hank Hill sticker prices, and these kids are doing their trade-up challenges. But, Jaren, as as 12-year-olds, that's crazy. I, I honestly don't even think I could spend my whole life training to do that and could be better than the way you make this 12-year-old sound. There, it was wild where when my partner was looking at one of the vendors, one of the kids, this kid noticed that they were holding some slabs and said, hey, do you want to trade, you know, for some of my slabs? And then she was like looking through his cards and immediately turns to me after we're, after like, you know, they talked and said, all, all these slabs are Garbo. Like, Damn. <laughs> so, you, you know, ki- kids, one not no shame too. You have that element of, of course, the vendor is probably going to take pity on this kid because mm-hmm. they're a child, but that's what they want you to do, man. That's what they want you to do. Mm-hmm. Where it's also saw another kid in part of that, you know, dad and son duo where he had this PSA 10 Umbreon card, like, you know, the plus one of those fake chains that wrap around it. So he wears it in his neck and that Umbreon <laughs> nice, card, Matt, nice, nice, worth nice. like $1,700 PSA 10. Insane. Insane, Damn. Matt. Well, you say seventeen hundred? Yep. Damn. Where whenever we see that Umbreon card being sold, it it, it does fluctuate between sixteen to seventeen hundred. So just to see that kid, like that kid part uh, vendor wearing it as a chain. Oh man, that's a mood, Matt. That's, that's a mood. <laughs> that's wild. That's wild. Where I was, I was really happy with our purchases overall, but. I think now, Matt, this is probably one of the last times for the foreseeable future that I'll probably talk about cards because uh, kind of the whole thing exhausting, Matt. It was a fun, Mm -hmm. you know, experience overall. Got to talk to a lot of cool people, got to see a lot of cool cards, you know, uh, came back with a lot of cards. But I think, you know, I took... uh, I removed eBay from my startup, you know, when you start oh. up Chrome and then it shows you your most visited uh, sites. Damn. You know, had to take that out just because can't do it for the foreseeable future. But maybe when I get that itch again, maybe mm-hmm. uh, I'll bring card talk back to the mistake zone. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Not, mm-hmm. Uh, that was my weekend adventures. And what were you up to uh, this past week of, and any mistakes you'd like to share with the class? Jaren, this past week, I was just hard grinding in ZZZ. Oh, Matt. Mm -hmm. I, too, when I could, especially Mm. this weekend, not went out and about, but stayed up later than I should have to, like you, Matt, grind some Zenless Zone Zero because some events were ending this oh, weekend or yeah. last weekend mm-hmm. and matt mm-hmm. mentioned it last week the golden week event uh how did you fare in your efforts <laughs> jaren i didn't even get to the start of chapter three uh, uh, mm-hmm. it's so to unlock for the past uh zone zone zero golden week event to be able to unlock it you need to have finished chapter three and to do that uh, part of the grind is your, I guess, your account player level, your mm-hmm. intranaut level. Mm-hmm. And to reach the certain checkpoints, you'd have to hit 34 and 36 specifically. And that sort of pads out the story. But yeah, as newer players trying to get to the specific events, that was a grind, Matt. That uh-huh. took a lot of effort. And... For me personally, I only unlocked um, the Golden Week stuff and the Snapshot stuff afterwards. Around the Golden Week, I was able to unlock Saturday at 1 Uh a.m. And the Jane story plus the, um, the Snapshot event, I was able to unlock around 10 p.m. Sunday evening. Mm -hmm. And... Not last night, mm-hmm. last Sunday evening, I played from 10 p.m. to around 3 a.m. to uh-huh. <laughs> kind of do everything. And not needless to say, I'm dying right now. Oh, man. Where the thing is, with a lot of these free-to-play gotcha adjacent games, their events, mm-hmm. especially big events like this, mm-hmm. are usually broken 
up piecemeal and unlock throughout the month or throughout the event duration. So you do a tiny part, you wait a week, and then a week later you do the next part and so on. Mm -hmm. When you grind all three events uh, in a condensed period uh, all at once, Matt, Mm -hmm. starting up ZZZ today and not having to do all that rigor rigmarole and just do the dailies and log out, it felt really weird. Oh, man. (laughs) Where for you, Matt, as Mm -hmm. not like the rewards are whatever. I, I, I think we both talked about how the golden week w drive would be nice to have which is like a specialized uh weapon for your character in in layman's terms i guess Mm -hmm. um but as someone who was trying to get there and hit i guess that grind how did that whole thing feel for you jaren it kind of was at first it seemed okay because you know i just had like i guess the backlog of all the um combat and explore missions to do yes and you know like i mentioned before uh on last week's episode like that stuff doesn't cost you any energy to do but i think like where my kind of frustration came in now is like it's very clear now that like how important the energy you have is in leveling because i think it's like you know all the like every energy you spend is like an equivalent amount of like xp that you you get and you don't isn't really. The, hmm? Isn't the rough exchange like ten energy is around a hundred XP? I think. Yeah, I think it's something like that. And man, Jeremy, without the, without I guess like that boost, uh, in I guess like all the the time that you know normal ZCC players would have had to like get it, it it really did feel a lot more grindy. I was I was I was like scouring for. For any any little crumb of experience, yes, and I was really disappointed that like I couldn't even you know there isn't even like any source of um experience at some point like without energy, which is like kind of yeah. a bummer. But because I know the gate coffee for one sp- so coffee gives you sixty energy plus like a specific boost mm-hmm. uh, for a currency mm-hmm. or uh, level up material, and I believe on Sundays they'll give you an extra cup of coffee, but you can only do that. Oh, once I didn't a even day. realize that. Damn. Where, yeah, I felt the same grind, especially when. Again, it pads out some elements of the story of you need to be this certain level before the next part of the story unlocks. And Mm -hmm. then you have to be this sort of level where it also, for me, one thing that was really frustrating was even though I had some of these, you know, um, combat and exploration missions, they were, I might not have a proper team or yeah. even if they were recommended for level 40, um, my team would still be kind of paper against them just because, oh, maybe my skills weren't leveled enough. Maybe my, mm-hmm. you know, W drive, our equipment wasn't leveled enough. So yeah, I was hitting these little roadblocks where even if it is, if some elements are energy gated, the other things that don't necessarily take energy have a different not necessarily skill check, but armor check or um, abilities check, Mm -hmm. Uh, not in addition to the level check itself. And sure, eventually you can level up to brute force your way there. But again, you to be able to increase your level cap, you need to eventually get to, you know, um, intranaut level or player level 40. And then that will give you to open up the game a bit more. So yeah, Mm -hmm. at, if we started at earlier, of course, we would have been able to get to the events in time. But yeah. again, if you're starting like with a week left and you're only at the beginning of chapter two, not, not a fun ride Matt, mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. Um, I did like the at that this point, it was, you know, 2 a.m. I'm doing the story, uh, the the photo bonus event as well. And that was pretty fun where essentially you meet this director and she's asking you just to go around to take pictures of his inspiration and stuff like that, where um, it was a neat event. But at that point, it's 2 a.m. for me, Matt. And mm-hmm. I'm just skipping all dialogue, have a, oh. an event guide in the mm-hmm. other uh, page just so I can get my <laughs> one pull worth of currency and then go to bed. Mm-hmm. But um, 
before we move on, Matt, mm-hmm. uh, some new characters are coming out. And to wrap up our ZZZ talk, yes. uh, do you have your pull uh, kind of rollout planned out? Or is there anything you're looking forward to within the next few weeks and months? Uh, I do kind of have a general idea. Um, so coming up in the, I guess, like, the major characters I'm mapping the next banners are going to for sure be, I think the next one is Caesar, and then Bernice is after her. And then I'm guessing Yanagi, though I'm not really sure if she is like a S rank character or an A rank character yeah. right now. But Jaren, I don't really have too much of an interest in uh Caesar. It's like um play socks. I don't really have a Team that can incorporate her right now. Um, Fair. Jaren, I blew so much. I, I blew all of my experience currency. And I think I shouldn't have. Trying to build a second team so I could progress further into Shiyu defense. Yeah. And Jaren, it gets really expensive to level up characters. It it does, Matt. Where, mm-hmm. I'll be honest, that Shiyu defense, I don't even understand that mode. So mm-hmm. I haven't really been touching it. So... <laughs> Jaren, I don't know, Matt. I think it it's also up. doesn't help that um, I'm guessing just like you, you've basically been playing, or we've basically been playing uh, primarily just the Jane Doe comp, which yeah. is basically, you know, in essence, two characters supporting Jane Jane Doe, who's going to yeah. be on the field, like, you know, 90% of the match. Mm-hmm. Um, the second team that I started uh, putting together is Lyakon, Corin, and Sokaku. And... Huh? Are you me? Because that's my second team as well. <laughs> Jared, the amount of like actual shuffling you need to do between these characters to optimize your playthrough of them is so wild. And the fact that the ordering of these characters matters is also wild. That I like, you know, never really considered that much. Matt, you need to give mm-hmm. me the flowchart of that team because I don't know what I'm doing with that team either. <laughs> Jared, I think I don't know what I'm doing either. From what I understand, the flow of that team is use Lyacon to create a stun or put somebody in the stun state because Jaren, goddamn, does he put characters into stun so, so quick. Mm-hmm. And then you follow up, you know, with Sokaku to, you know, for the follow up, she'll throw down her flag and then she can pass her buff onto Corin, who you just do, you know, a any kind of saw drill on to the stun character and then you switch off. To back to Lyacon and you do that loop again. I believe that that is the the loop that you're going for. Um, right. Maybe switching to Sokaku later or at a different point so that you can pass on like the full um, flag effect where she has her like her her three um, charges built up already before you pass right. it on to the Corin. But yeah, Jaren, I I burned a lot of uh, currency on there and I think maybe. I should have never. I should have just, you know, waited and and just like buffed my my Jane team more. But you know, going back to the Jane team and uh, the pulls, I want to pull for Bernice. I think, like I said, I, since I'm missing Grace from my team, and I also don't have a Seth. Like that is Bernice is like I think a character that's going to fill the a role in my team of like uh so i want to run lucy jane bernice i think is going to be like the next most solid team for me okay um but jaren i really want to see how uh yanagi works because as i mentioned like last um last week when i was talking about uh, zzz I am pulling Bernice because she is a functionally good character for my team. Not so much that I particularly like Bernice as a character. But if Yanagi is a... uh, She's already shown to be a lightning anomaly character. But if she's an off-field lightning anomaly character, I think I would rather roll her because I like her design better. And I like the concept of Spears a lot, like I've mentioned before on the... uh, Mm-hmm. The mistake zone. So that is a much more appealing character in terms of design and potentially uh, function. So I, I'm i I'm really interested in seeing um, and hoping that they, they kind of like show her kit uh, before before too long. Or before like, you know, Bernice's banner goes uh, 
goes away. All right. I think for me, I might YOLO roll a few on Caesar because apparently uh, she's a shield, mm-hmm. a damage amp, and uh, people are saying like an amazing stunner character. And mm-hmm. Matt, as we as you mentioned, stun uh, stun equals damage in this game. Yeah. Where. Uh, that might be something that I would want to play around with my rotation, but with Inagi, that that, that must mean Miyabi's right around the corner as mm-hmm. well. At that least I would be. hope. That has to be. Where I, I'll do a few YOLO rolls for Caesar. No disrespect to Bernice. Um, I probably would skip her banner, and then I, I'd, I'll pray for the November uh, Miyabi mm-hmm. <laughs> drop mm-hmm. that and try to... Yeah. Um, role there but with i think jane's banner is ending within either tonight or tomorrow while we're recording Mm -hmm. uh still fighting off the urge to try to (laughs) roll her w drive but let's be honest matt that that won't end well for me Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh mm -hmm. but that was our z uh zzz minute i guess Mm check-in um still enjoying it matt still Mm -hmm, we're mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, but it's that with a lot of these service games, you know, whether it be Genshin as well, uh, now for ZZZ, it really scratches that, you know, progression itch that WoW instilled in me you <laughs> uh-huh, know, back uh-huh. in the day, where I always liked the idea of a single player MMO. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is scratching that itch so that's why I'm currently addicted to it much to um, the I don't know because Matt mm-hmm. Bang Dream recently updated and I am i don't even care about making it to top 1000 for these events damn, just to get damn. the maximum premium payout I think it's a little oh, no. too, li- uh, too little too late <laughs> for Bang Dream uh, that uh-huh. Maybe uh, that leaves the rotation and ZZZ fully takes its place. Oh, no. But Jared, I can't Matt, believe the Bang Dream is dead. Had to happen sooner or later, Matt. Had oh, to happen man. sooner or later. But mm-hmm. uh, I feel like we've talked about ZZZ a lot for the last three weeks. So I think for a change, something new, Matt. Mm-hmm. Something new mm-hmm. in the form of sort of something old. But uh-huh. Matt... Mm-hmm. UFO 50 came yes. out last week and this has been a game that a lot of people within the video game I guess uh, enthusiast um, vlogger uh, media realm have been you know looking forward to ever since it was announced way back when this was kind of an I forget when it was announced but it's been approaching several years at this point but Mm -hmm. UFO 50 is the website describes it as a collection of 50 games you know ranging from single player to multiplayer games from the creators of Spelunky Downwell, Airland and Sea uh, Skripulak, uh, Catacomb Kids and Madhouse Mm -hmm. where one of the points that these stress is these aren't mini games, these aren't micro games, these are are full games that well full in the sense of ufo 50 is within this wrapper of in an alternative universe ufo soft was a developer in the 80s that released a bunch of different games and this is the equivalent of you you know opening up a storage locker and opening a box tucked away that contains your UFO system and 50 different cartridges Mm -hmm. where, you know, you start the game up and immediately unlocked from the go are 50 different games that, you know, were created within the eighties. When you scroll through the library, they each have a year associated with them. So even though there are 50 games, some of them are sequels to ones that came out previously some of them are spiritual successors and it's it really pushes that overall aesthetic mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. where even though they're not micro games they're not uh, mini games the are of i guess length 
of what you would expect from games of the 80s in, mm-hmm. in that sense. Mm-hmm. Where at so with 50 games at your disposal, Matt, currently I've only touched, I think, six of them. Oh, okay. And I'll kind of go through the ones I played through and give some quick impressions. Um Matt, I I sort the cartridges through uh you know chronologically. So I started off with the first game right off the bat. Mm-hmm. And Matt, mm-hmm. it starts off at 1980 with Barbuda, uh, which is this side scrolling game where you're a knight and I believe you're traversing through a castle and your life bar are these different eggs. And Matt, mm-hmm. it's <laughs> what you would expect from a side scrolling castle exploration game. Uh, that was supposedly made in the 80s uh-huh. where, you know, you're going to different rooms. You're trying to basic. So, Matt, your controls for all the games, you know, really utilize your D-pad and the a or and two buttons, essentially. So mm-hmm. uh, really reminiscent of, let's say, an Atari controller or an NES controller. Were you so, using a, a D-pad or were you using like a control stick to, to like play around with it? For me, every game I played, I use the D-pad and mm. AB. So I've played on you know my PC and primarily on the Steam Deck as well. I see. Where Veruda, Matt, mm-hmm. not my thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Didn't like these types of games <laughs> growing up. So you know, played a few minutes of this and thought, hey, this mm-hmm. is one of those games. Uh, not necessarily for me. So moving on. I got to probably the game that I put the most time into where I think of the six games I've played, probably 80% of my overall play time went to Magic Garden. And Matt, okay, this is a puzzle game that is this odd... It, it's sort of like Pac-Man meets Snake in a way where you play mm. as this girl... And she's in this, I guess, forest area. And there's a witch throwing different enemies at you. So that picture a grid. Mm -hmm. And you're a girl walking around this grid. And there are these pink, let's say, friends that you go around the grid uh, snake style. And you collect these friends. Where you collect the different friends and you start to get a chain of friends following you. Mm -hmm. And there are also enemy enemy i guess different colored blobs that are your enemies that you want to avoid and then they'll move around the grid um they'll look to see which direction they're going to move to next so that's also an element uh, you have to consider so Mm -hmm. with your friends your goal is to get as many as you can uh and then when you get to a point in the there's an area of the grid that's highlighted and you want to deposit your friends there where say I have a, it might be in the form of a straight line that goes, you know, vertically, horizontally, or just a cluster there. And you want to kind of position your character and your friend chain in a way that when you drop them off, everyone's going to be dropped off in that highlighted area. I see. And you get scored up how many friends you drop off. And then after a certain amount of friends dropped off, a power up will spawn in the area which is essentially your power pellet where you get it and you're able to eat or dispose of any of the enemies within the grid in that period so i see um i think that's basically the type of game i'm really looking for out of a collection like this just you know something you can pick up um hard easy to pick up hearts master uh and just chase the leaderboards or at least in-game leaderboards i'm not sure if there are online leaderboards oh, okay. or yeah, even friend leaderboards mm-hmm. but um that was the game that really you know just got me hooked on uh the ufo 50 package where mm-hmm. really liked magic garden um and i think for a lot of these games matt where you can pull up a in a light instruction manual that shows, you know, the different premise, the genre, and the controls. Uh, similar to me growing up and visiting my cousin with his NES. You know, I just go in blind, Matt, and figure it <laughs> along the way. Uh-huh. And the next game I went to was a game called Velgris, where, you know, I believe you're playing as 
one of the char- the woman on the cover art or part of the cover art with all the different characters with the gun. And the story is your ship or something, you crash land on a planet, you're thrown into this big pit and you have to kind of climb up the pit. You have a gun. And that, this is a precision platformer where mm-hmm. every time you jump, the little saw um, at your feet kind of crawls up as well. Mm-hmm. And it's one of those where, you know, you have a blaster, you can aim up, you can shoot down. Uh, but the thing jumps are floaty you can double jump as well but when you land on a block you only have a few seconds before that block under your feet crumbles ah, that's and classic. so mm. it's a game that encourages you to move really fast be really precise on your jumps and know okay this is oh uh, i can if this is a cloud block i can double jump through it or if this is a rock block or a box block i have to break it before i can go through and then enemies are of course hitting going at you and that Mm -hmm. surprise not for me (laughs) well uh moving on we get to fist hell this is your classic beat-em-up game matt Mm -hmm. and as someone who likes beat-em-up games uh you know no frills, really classic beating up game. I make it to the first boss and I die and think, okay, that was a good uh, attempt at this boss. I, I don't have its pattern down, so I've got to replay the first area all over again. And mm-hmm. one of those, Matt, one of those. Mm-hmm. Um, next was Overbold, uh, second last game I played so far. And this is a spiritual successor, I think, to Velgress, where, you know, same character, but this time you crash land on another alien planet and it's a arena style shooter where, Mm -hmm. you know, you're going around and have to kill the enemies that also spawn within the arena in the given time. And Matt, it has light rogue elements just because every time you finish a level you'll earn currency and then you can buy a different power up that you want to use or you can also for the next round uh increase the difficulty you know more enemies spawn to get more money to and then in turn buy more power ups Mm -hmm. nothing persistent uh but um this is also something that i was also trying to push a bit more uh, just because it is, again, that's something I want from this type of game. Uh, You know, just easy to pick up, easy to, you know, play for a few minutes and then kind of quit out. Where um, the last game I tried out was Night Manor. And Matt, this was your adventure puzzle point and click game. Uh, You wake up in a mysterious room with amnesia and you're clicking around trying to find items and uh, essentially get out of the room and then in turn uh, explore that area and just figure out where you are. So I think in terms of, you know, just overall presentation, this was the most, even though it wasn't the 1989 game, I still Mm -hmm. feel like this was the one that um, kind of, I guess pushes above its the 1980s weight class, if that makes sense. I see. I where see. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though it still has that aesthetic, you would think that, oh, you sure this isn't a 90s game? But not, maybe mm-hmm. my mm-hmm. perception of time is, you know, not great. But, mm-hmm. you know, this game contains, you know, even though there are those smaller scale games, there are also larger open world adventures and JRPGs also included that I really haven't uh touched upon but yeah those are the one games i've played of ufo 50 so far Mm -hmm. uh can't get enough of that magic garden matt but Mm -hmm. did want to ask you um with something like a ufo 50 because i know this was something that uh was on your radar as well but Mm -hmm. all 50 games unlocked from the start how do you feel about that and kind of the design choice to kind of forego any meta narrative um, unlock approach to the library? I I think I like it because Jaren, like fifty games is a lot of games, and from what I've seen of a uh, UFO fifty, I kind of like did go through some videos and stuff of. People kind of just like playing all a bunch of the different games. Jaren, some of these look like clunkers. 
And, Mm -hmm. you know, if it was, like, in, I don't know, like, an experience-based system or something where, you know, you had to, like, play a certain game or a certain number of games or, you know, like, accumulate something in some way uh, to unlock, like, games further down the line, I wonder if they would, you know, either front load the good games or possibly, you know, uh, like, lock away the good games so you have to, like, you know, grind for the ones that look very interesting. Like, I I think that having them all unlocked from the start is definitely the way to go for this kind of collection. Mm-hmm. And that brings me to something I was curious about from your perspective as well. Mm-hmm. With, a, with 50 games available at the rip, do you think that does something to how you approach and spend time with the collection? Like, are you more likely just to, you know, sample a bunch of different things? Or do you seek out something that you actually want to sink your teeth into? Because for me personally, I think having... It's that choice paralysis where Mm -hmm. I'm looking at 50 different icons and I'm kind of just going in and with 50 all available if it immediately doesn't click with me Mm -hmm. you know i'm backing out to the menu and trying Uh something else where how how do you kind of approach something like this i mean jaren okay so i like the way that they showed the um kind of like pick your game screen Mm -hmm. because um like it is in, in essence just a bunch of like box art i guess uh, yeah. Of like all these things, and Jaren, I don't know why, but or well, like I mean, I do know why, but like it really brings me back to the time of you know going to the the local like blockbuster and yeah. looking at covers of games and like you know seeing oh which do I want to spend my weekend in based solely on <laughs> the art of the like the front art, cover art and the back of, I guess they don't have the do they have a like a back of the box equivalent for when you're like picking these games Jaren? You you can bring up I, I believe if you top like X it will you know give you a description and the controls. So I see I see for not necessarily I wish it kind of gave you screenshots as well, but mm-hmm. uh you do get the description at the very least. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so like I don't know. I I kind of got that feeling and I do think that there are some games where I would probably just like look at it and be like, I I don't think that I'm even going to like open this one. And I do think that like, you know, having the 50 is definitely detrimental in the amount of time that I would look or like, um, you know, try to see if this game is like a match for me mm-hmm. instead of just like, you know, if I guess like if that's like one merit of the unlocking uh version of like i like these games where you know you would have to spend at least a little bit of time with all the games but i definitely think that uh if i had this i would just probably insta bounce once i felt like i got the gist of the game like i could definitely see myself opening a game looking at it for like 15 seconds and being like okay i get the gist of this i don't want to play this anymore yeah yeah, that's fair Mm -hmm. and i think for me the reason i played the six games uh, is I just looked at what the cover, you know, quote unquote cover art was and the name. And if it sounded or looked kind of cool based on that, mm-hmm. I'll start it up. But I think moving forward with the game, I'm going to be more likely to read the descriptions yeah. and see what it's all about. Just because, uh, Matt, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, it's being promoted that there's an op- there's open world adventure equivalents, there's JRPG equivalents, and I feel like that's something where I need to be in the right mindset to kind of engage with where, yeah, you know, since yeah. I'm so, I, I really felt an attachment to Overbold and Magic Garden specifically where mm-hmm. maybe I'm just going to look at what's close to the quote unquote arcade uh, tag or anything equivalent where uh, that those more bite sized experiences and Maybe eventually I'll get around to the JRPG just to see how that is handled. But yeah, man, Mm -hmm. UFO 50 available now. Uh, I believe it was 25. Its launch price was 25 USD, 10% off, of course. Mm -hmm. So I think 
I ended it ended up being just under 30 Canadian. I'm not too sure, but yeah, definitely something I'm excited to pop in and out of. Just uh, you know, just try something uh, and hope that uh, something is able to hook me. But mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. Uh, this is a good Steam Deck game, and mm-hmm. I'm surprised it's not on the Switch yet. But yes, Matt. Mm-hmm. This is definitely something I could see on the Switch successor as well, which mm-hmm. not yes. Where did all these Switch Two leaks come from, Jaren? So, like over the past, I think like week or two, there have been a bunch of Switch leaks that have, in essence, come from a factory in China that like where they are manufacturing Switch Two parts and components, mm-hmm. and. Basically, it was also, like, at some point, somebody had 3D printed every single one of these, like, CAD files and just put it together to, like, you know, show people what the the shape of the new Switch is or could be. And, Jaren, it honestly just looks like a bigger version of the Switch. Um, you know, it has different kind of, like, Joy-Con um, ports. It has... The exact same amount of buttons, which I, I honestly was a little bit disappointed in. I, Jaren, ever since I got the um, 8-bit though Ultimate Controller, and like ever since I saw like, um, the like, what is the name of the really fancy uh, Xbox controllers? Oh, like the Elite controllers? Yeah, is that the one that has like the paddles on the back? I think so. Yeah, like ever since I saw those, I was really really hoping that like you know in. In in some point, uh, deep in my heart, I was really, really hoping that the back panel button or the the back trigger buttons, your the buttons that are like kind of at your like middle finger, ring finger area, would would become a regular thing because I really like that as a concept. Mm-hmm. But you know, it, they're they're not doing it, or at least the switch two appears to not be doing it. Sad, Matt. Sad. Mm-hmm. I, I do like a good back bumper, especially mm-hmm. on the Steam Deck. I like uh, at least using the Steam controller functions mm-hmm. to map that to certain things. Mm-hmm. Jaren, I I know a lot of people didn't like it. I kind of, like, at some point started to like the the reverse touchscreen on the Vita. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. the Vita. <laughs> uh, I like the Vita. I uh-huh. like the Vita a lot. Uh-huh. You're, yeah. Actually, you know what? The, uh, I just remembered because um, I just wanted to to put this out there. Um, you know, before we get too far away from UFO fifty and too deep into the switch, I think that UFO fifty being a, I guess, like the more D pad oriented game. Mm-hmm. I think just recently the PS five or I guess like Sony um, released actual, you know, software from their side to make the PS five controller compatible with PC. So yeah. you're not just having to use, you know, like stuff like Joy to Key or, you know, kind of just like messing with, you know, generic Bluetooth controllers. And I feel like if UFO 50 is going to be played on something, I think probably the PS5 controller is going to be a good one to use. Uh, Matt, now that you put that into the universe, I I think that would be a pretty good one to use. Well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, but yeah, yeah, going back to the, the, the Switch 2. Jaren, I think the kind of biggest thing that uh, people are talking about in terms of the design that the Switch 2 has is that it now has two USB-C ports. One on the bottom, which is where, like, you know, the standard charging port is, and one at the top of the Switch, which is, is new. And a lot of people are having a lot of very interesting ideas on what this could mean. And... I want to jump onto this as a topic, Jaren, because okay. in addition to that um, new USB C port at the top, there is a um, Nintendo had filed a kind of new thing with the FCC that is a non-controller, non-game console device that works via USB C and. It is like kind of like the first of its um, kind as far as like what has been shown um, with regards to Nintendo's other like I think patents are the things that go to the FCC. But Jared also interestingly on this um, this like new FCC filing, it has a 
kind of like embargo that nothing about it can be shown other than like very basic concept concepts for 180 days which mm. is from right now about march which is when a lot of people are thinking now that like nintendo has to have or is going to be revealing the uh switch 2 especially with all okay. these like leaks coming out yeah but Jared, so again just to mm. preface this these are all leaks. Nothing confirmed. Nothing confirmed. Just, Nothing confirmed. Yeah. This is all speculation, which is, Jaren, why I want to speculate with you the possibility that the Switch to upper USB port is going to be for peripherals. Because, mm. Jaren, we've said this so much on the Mistake Zone, so much on Saturday Morning Arcade. We lived in the age of peripherals. Yep. And the the kind of ex- excitement and dread that I feel in my heart, Jaren, of the age of peripherals coming back is kind of exciting, Jaren. I I I really, really hope that we are we're gonna get into some peripheral bullshit in the uh, Not- future with Switch. Mm-hmm. What type of peripheral bullshit would you want? Just because when you brought it up, uh, mm-hmm. oh, we might be <laughs> returning to this area. I immediately thought of one, mm-hmm. the Game Boy camera, and yes. two, the Game Boy printer. Mm-hmm. Those two are where... both like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now I'm thinking of a dorky webcam that you attach and clamps onto your Switch to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like. I definitely think that um, there could be a Connect style camera there. Um, you know, do do I guess like more motion tracking stuff. Um, right. I'm very interested in seeing if they're going to expand on the kind of like Nintendo Labo stuff. Mm. Uh, because I'm interested in seeing if like they're going to pull anything weird there. Um, one thing that I'm actually also very interested in is this kind of like concept of it being a extender for a new. Sc- Another either like a dual screen or a detachable screen, which I really like the idea of a um, second detachable screen because the theories that I was being I was seeing being thrown around is that it could lead to a second screen that slides into a um, Joy-Con, and then the Joy-Con can be used uh, the Joy-Con and the screen can be used to do. It's not, it's not called asynchronous gameplay. Um, what is it called, Jaren? The kind of gameplay that the Wii U had, where you could do, like, you know, people were playing stuff on the um, TV screen, but then there's the tablet player who has, like, a different sort of gameplay. Oh, God. I, the name slips me right now, but not... Asymmetrical. Think, asymmetrical gameplay. Asymmetrical, yes. Yeah. Playing that packing game that came with the, Switch, the Wii U mm-hmm. and us being in Julian's living room... Uh, trying it out. I think that was that's the only uh-huh. <laughs> memory I have attached with yeah uh, the Wii U at this point. Mm-hmm. Where I think something like that could be actually really cool. Yeah, and maybe Nintendo's attempt to say, "Hey, the Wii U could have worked," mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but I think with this idea that it might be really peripheral heavy. Uh, and the possibility of a second dual screen. Mm-hmm. It's. I wonder if that is the case and how much of that will be utilized. Just because, again, mm-hmm. this would be additional add-ons that... Uh, I'm curious who other than Nintendo would try to capitalize on that. Yeah. And what the attachment rate would be where... I know it's fun to think of the more wacky and fun things that they can do, but I also wonder if this is just merely a convenience thing of (laughs) they just want a additional USB port there for, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, charging purposes or docking purposes. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. who knows, Matt, what we can see. But uh, in terms of other things that, you know, again, quote unquote, these are things that leaked out, nothing confirmed. But yeah. In terms of the leaks that have been spreading, was there anything else that caught your attention? Uh, for me, not specifically. Like, mm-hmm. I honestly, though, Jaren was very surprised that the Switch 2, based on, like, the CAD file leaks, is honestly noticeably bigger 
than the right. uh, standard Switch. And for, you know, the Switch having the Switch Lite, I'm surprised they made the Switch to a bigger size. Or, like, you know, I guess like the standard Switch to a, a bigger size. Mm-hmm. Where, I don't know, Matt. You also had the a lot of... Uh, scuttlebutt of oh here's a 3D printed mock-up of apparently everything mm-hmm. there. Uh, it was it was really it was quite a experience trying to follow it. A lot of sorting through what might be real yeah. question mark yeah. and what might just be clickbait trying to capitalize on the hubbub. But at the end of the day, it was just a lot of. Man, they really should reveal this soon. Mm-hmm. Where, mm-hmm. given there are all these leaks, Matt, do you think that pushes Nintendo's hand at the moment? Or do you think that we still might not see this until early next year? I I don't think that it's going to push Nintendo's hand. I think they don't care. <laughs> I, mm-hmm. I think they're going to show off the Switch 2 whenever they were planning to show off the Switch 2. Yeah. But I, I'm hoping that uh, it will push their hand. Uh, sorry, Matt. They're too busy uh, suing Pocket Pair uh, yep. over uh, apparent patents. But Matt, mm-hmm. you know what we're... I don't even want to say we're experts in. Matt, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know what we're <laughs> hobbyists in? What are we at hobbyists the very in? Least? Well, Don't match me challenges. Mm-hmm, Matt, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's my turn this week to bring you a Don't Match Me challenge where we'll go through five different categories. And your all you have to do to win this little game is to think of an answer that doesn't match our answers. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the very least, my answers. But if you want to take the hard approach, uh, none of our answers. And if you don't know... A if you can't come up with an answer, you know, feel free just to pause the episode, uh, pause wherever you're listening to us, look it up real quick, and hope whatever you looked up doesn't match what we looked up. Mm -hmm. Uh, Matt, Mm -hmm. uh, to celebrate the release of UFO 50 and the six games that I played this week, Mm -hmm. uh, here's a (laughs) UFO 50 inspired (laughs) question mark don't match me challenge for the week Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. Matt. Mm -hmm. so starting off really general uh as i mentioned earlier velgress has our protagonist falling into a pit and trying to get out of it Mm -hmm. Matt, Mm -hmm. simple simple broad name a game where there is a pit you can fall into (laughs) oh so matt Mm -hmm. common trap common you know I guess, thing to dodge, common level. Just name a pit, Matt, that Mm -hmm. you can fall into. Uh, Pretty easy, Matt. Pretty easy. You probably won't match me in five, four, three, two, one. I hope you and our friends didn't say Super Smash Brothers Brawl. Ooh, Jared, I said Vector Man. (laughs) Matt, mm-hmm. will we ever see our boy Vector Man come back? I, I feel like I ask you this every year. Jared, I I want to see Vector Man come back. I don't think he's going to come back. Uh, fair enough, Matt. He, fair he enough. lives in cool spot now. Matt, mm-hmm. in the game Magic Garden, you play a girl in some, you know, it's a blend of Pac-Man and Snake. Mm-hmm. Matt, pretty simple. Name a Metal Gear Solid game. Oh, uh, you know, I was going to say name a game with a snake, but mm-hmm. <laughs> honestly, when you say name a game with a snake, it's probably going to be a Metal Gear Solid game. So just name a Metal Gear Solid game okay. in five, four, three, two, one. Matt, mm-hmm. don't know if snakes in it, but I said Metal Gear Rising. Oh, Jared, and I just went with the classic Metal Gear Solid three. <laughs> Nice. Mm-hmm. Nice. Good mm-hmm. game, Matt. Good mm-hmm. game. Where uh probably should have put this earlier than the snake question, but in Barbuda, your health bar is technically eggs. Matt. <laughs> Just simple. Simple. Going <laughs> we're we're doing the snakey uh thing here as well, where you know might start off really broad, might get specific and back broad again, where Matt. Mm-hmm. 
Just name any game where you can collect an egg. Ooh, collect an egg. Yes. Where you can pick up an egg and collect it. Matt, name any game where you can collect an egg in five, four, three, two, one. Matt, Mm -hmm. I said Vampire Survivors. Ooh, Jaren, I am not 100% sure on this one because I, you can collect eggs in Banjo-Kazooie, right? Like as ammo for Kazooie or am I imagining that? Let's look it up. Matt, Mm -hmm. you can and you are correct. Mm Mm-hmm. Moving on to question four, Matt. Mm-hmm. Night Manor was a... I was actually impressed. I wasn't expecting Night Manor to be a point-and-click adventure game. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. simple. Uh, name another point-and-click adventure game. Ooh. So, Matt, mm-hmm. while we think of you know, potential answers, were you big on the point-and-click adventures growing up? Not really i think they were always like too abstract for me um Mm -hmm. i i think it wasn't until like more recently when they started adding stuff like hey instead of you know having to click all all over the screen we're just gonna highlight the points that you can click on and (laughs) make it a lot easier for you fair enough Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. you know counting down in five four three two one matt Mm -hmm. i went with the classic Maniac Mansion. Ooh, Jaren, I I went with something that I've been championing for a while now. Uh, Case of the Golden Idol. Ah, good pick, good modern pick, Matt. Good mm-hmm. modern pick. Mm-hmm. And Matt, finally, mm-hmm. you know, when I read the name Fist Hell, <laughs> I thought, man, mm-hmm. that's a good name. Mm-hmm. That's a good name. Mm-hmm. You know what I also as- associate with fists and hell? <laughs> What's that, Jaren? Tekken. Matt, oh, man. For my final uh, category this week, name a Tekken game. Oh, man. Name a Tekken game where you try to become the king of the Iron Fists and you fight demons. So, Matt? You fight name... demons in Tekken? Jared, I, mean, I don't know a lot about Tekken. So Double Jin, right? right? Oh, okay, right, okay, okay, okay. Yes, okay. <laughs> but, Matt, name mm-hmm. any Tekken game in five, four, three two one gotta pick the one with Jin on the cover tekken four mm. Jaren, you count street fighter cross tekken <laughs> oh that's a good matt mm-hmm. coming back to steam as well <laughs> uh, topical matt good pull good pull got, him. got, got him. me on that one matt got me on that one mm-hmm. uh and that was my all over the place barely related to <laughs> ufo 50 uh don't match me for this week matt mm-hmm Another sort of beefy episode. Thought we would get under 50 minutes, but hey, what can Mm -hmm. you do? Stuff Mm -hmm. happens. Mm -hmm. But want to thank you this week, as always, for joining me and editing this. mm, I was going to say fine podcast, but editing this podcast (laughs) of ours. Jared, I want to, you know, say thanks. And as always, I want to thank you for, as always, hosting this podcast of ours and, you know, bringing the meat of UFO 50 to this, uh, this episode. Thanks, man. Uh, who else should we thank this week? Matt? Mm-hmm. I want to th- thank uh, Amelia Watson from Hollow Live. Oh, uh, yes. want to thank also UFOs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to thank 50-year-olds, uh, the good ones <laughs> at the very <laughs> least. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Matt, mm-hmm. I want to thank Beverages. Hey. Because I drank some water during this episode. Oh, man. I also drank some water during this episode. Thanks, wa- Matt. We should probably think water. Thank, thank water. Thanks, thanks, water. Thanks, water. And Matt, mm-hmm. as we uh, go on to stay hydrated, please take it away. This has been Mistake Zone, and we're all out of grinding for Golden Week events.